Good morning. Good morning. Glad that you're here this morning. Shine leaned over to me a while ago and said that uh, I ordered you a, a, a book, a, another Bible, with large print. <laughs> I don't know what she really means by that. Other than the fact that I think she doesn't like that I have my glasses on, and then I look up and looking over y'all with my glasses like this, and oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think uh, it makes it more like a teacher, a schoolmaster, something looking over the body and kind of getting on there. I can't see when I do this, so it's just blurry. But anyway, so, uh, we're going to be in John chapter 12 today. We're going to be in verses 27 to 50. We're going to wrap up John chapter 12. And I titled this, Looking to the Father, Look to the Father. You know, we're, we're, our culture seems to be, well, it's just perplexing to me sometimes. Um, we're, we're attacking masculinity, and we're actually atta attacking Femininity, and I'm not really sure why. Why it's no longer okay for a man to be a man, and why it's not okay for a woman to be a woman or a lady to be a lady. And then, on top of that, why it's no longer okay for a man to be a godly man. And for a lady to be a godly lady. And we're attacking that. And it seems like our culture is just in an uproar with all of these things. But really before we get into the lesson, I want us to, to, to reflect a little bit on the relationship between Jesus and his father. Jesus... Love his father. And the father loved Jesus. And the greatest, the greatest thing that Jesus wanted when he was on earth was to be unified with his father. And when Jesus started his ministry, God was there and affirmed his ministry. You remember when Jesus was baptized by John? It was God sitting like a dove. The Spirit is sitting like a dove. God speaking. Affirming His Son. And several times throughout Scripture, we see that God did this. God affirmed Jesus three times in His ministry. And it shows me how a father should treat his son. The relationship between God the Father and Jesus the Son shows me a relationship that is to be between a father and a son. It shows me the relationship a son should have with his father. And not just boys. It shows me how a father ought to be with his children. And his children to be with their father. Now the next step that I'm going to say I we're talking about daddy's intersection, but that is not to minimize the necessity and the need of a mother in a home. Mothers are valuable and vital to the health of the home, but so is the father. Every child needs affirmation from their dads. Every child needs their father to be actively involved in their lives. Every dad needs to be a hands-on dad. When a child, especially boys, 
do not have an active father in their lives, they will seek out that affirmation of some sort from a male or males. That's why the gang population exploded in the late 50s, early 60s. When the fathers were abandoning their homes and their duty and their responsibility to their children and their duty and their responsibility to their wives. Because males seek male companionship and affirmation. Jesus was no exception. Jesus, several times in his ministry, needed to go off by himself to reconnect with God the Father. So I was looking in the text this morning in John chapter 12, starting in verse 27. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. And others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. How, how long do I have? So let's stop there for a second. The very first thing we see here that Jesus says, I'm troubled in my soul. We need to understand that Jesus was both 100% man and 100% deity, 100% God. And how that works, I still haven't figured that out. But one thing I do see in this text is Jesus was facing his fear. Fear of what he was about to endure. Jesus knows, now like I said, this is the beginning towards the end of John. He has a few days left before he faces the cross. He knows what he's about to endure. He knows he's about to be lied on, lied about. He knows he's about to be slandered. He knows he's about to be spit upon. He knows he's about to be beaten. He knows he's about to be whipped with a cat of nine tails. And incidentally, every time those cat of nine tails hit the flesh because they had bits of bone and metal in them would tear the flesh up. So much so that, that history shows that you could actually see down into a person's back and see the wound. Jesus knows what he's about to endure. And he's afraid. And he's troubled in his spirit for what he's about to endure. John here gives us a picture into the death of Jesus' spirit. He knew he was going to be beaten. He knew he was going to be whipped. He knew he was going to eventually be nailed to a cross. Jesus needed to hear from his Father. The hour has come. The time is now. And God glorified his Son. And not only did God glorify his Son, God also said, I will glorify you. And he will do that at the cross. John is giving us a glimpse into Jesus' soul. Jesus had glorified the name of God by a lifetime of obedience. And he would also glorify it by his death. God is answering Jesus yet for a third time, confirming that Jesus is his son. The first was at his baptism that we see in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. And the second was at his transfiguration in Matthew 17 and verse 5. And now here, for the third time, Jesus also makes the statement 
that the people needed to hear is this was for you, not for me. The people needed to hear this as well. Some heard it as a thunder. Some said it was an angel speaking. But I wonder, I just wonder, if his disciples actually heard the words God said. God answered Jesus to give him strength for what he was about to endure. It was also for his disciples to convince them that this was all in accordance with God's plan. You see, God didn't take away this burden. God didn't take away this pain that he was about to endure. But he was with his son. And he glorified his son and he gave him what his son needed to hear. There are times, us dads, when we know our children are going to have to face some painful things. Whether it's physical or emotional or psychological. And we wish we could take it all away. And protect them. But we can't. Because that does not prepare them. What we do. Is we walk with them. Through it. Encouraging them. Challenging them. Loving them. And being there for them. When the pain is so great. And we pick them up. And we hold them. And I don't care if my boy is 16 years old. If he's hurting that badly. I'm going to pick him up and I'm going to hold him. Because I think that's what God is doing with Jesus. Sustaining him and holding him up. There is a confusion with the people. We're going to keep reading here. Where did I leave off there? See, I get so excited I forget where I left off. Verse 34. Thank you. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. So there's confusion with the people. They thought the Christ would reign forever. The Old Testament teaches that the Christ will reign forever, eternally. They thinking that this was going to be a forever reign, this physical reign. And they could not get it around, wrapped around their minds that the Christ, their leader, their king, is going to die. Because when they heard this, they thought, well, this can't be now the Christ because that's contrary to Scripture. And yet they didn't understand the Scriptures. So there was this mass confusion. And also, they would not understand that Christ had to be crucified. Just like he, just like he had all these miracles in front of him. The whole entire time, doing all these wonders and signs in front of them. Speaking openly and plainly and tra transparently. And yet still refusing to believe. How much more proof do you need that I am He whom the Father has sent? He says this over and over and over again. Let's keep reading. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn as I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authority, believed in him, but for the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. 
so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So there's unbelief and there's fear. And Jesus now decides to depart from them. The text says he goes and he hides himself from them. I think it's time here for Jesus to say, my public ministry is concluded. I need to be with the disciples for a little while longer. Because there are some things that they need to know and understand before I go to the cross. Before I am killed. <clears throat> Before I'm resurrected. Many here, it says, still refused to believe. They refused to believe the signs. They refused to believe and accept that the one that they were supposed to be looking for is now here. And the reason this is, is also because it's also to fulfill prophecy. Now remember what we talked about last week. And if you remember from last year when we talked about the significance of Jesus' baptism, everything has to be done according to prophecy. Everything has to be fulfilled. He came and said that I come to fulfill all prophecy. If anything is out of sorts with Jesus' ministry as in accordance with Scripture, he is not the Christ. Everything has to be done according to Scripture. Which tells me, Scripture has all authority. Putting a significance on Scripture. And here in also this text, it says that many did believe because of all these things. But they wouldn't confess. And they wouldn't confess, even though they believed in the signs, they still weren't willing to give up everything. Because if they did confess, the thing that they would lose most dearest to them at that time was being cast out in synagogue through the Pharisees. The thing that was most dear to them, a place where they went and worshipped God. And the reason they wouldn't confess is because they sought more after a man's murder, that is the Pharisees, than God's murder. So Jesus now closes his public ministry and he now gives his attention to his disciples. And he concludes John chapter 12 by saying, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that this command is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And it's interesting that this, this comes as saying, Jesus cries out. Now before he goes and withdraws himself from his public ministry, he cries out as if in one last ditch attempt to get the people to understand. Making one last appeal by saying, whoever believes in me, believes in him who sent me. He has uttered this several, several times throughout his ministry. And he's urging them, he's pleading with them, because he also feels the emotion and the strain of the cross that is right before him. And he knows he's about to endure this pain, and he knows he's about to go. He knows he's about to not be with them physically. And he's making one last appeal. Believe in me. Because if you don't believe in me, and you don't believe the words I'm saying that comes from the Father, it's the Father who's going to judge you. 
because of your discipline. Jesus is trying to save them from this judgment. And he's also reiterating that everything he has done has been done with the authority given to him from God. And he's appealing to them again in that area, in that aspect. That it's not on my accord that I'm doing all these things. I'm doing this because God the Father has told me to do these things. I am an obedient son. And I must do what the God, my Father, tells me to do. Because I'm unified with Him. I am one with Him. And quite simply, He's doing this because He wants them to be saved. He doesn't want them to perish. That's the reason He's got to go to the cross. That's the reason that the perfect blood has to be shed to cover the sins of all humanity. For anyone who wants forgiveness from sin has to come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And to come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, then you need to know who Jesus Christ is. And you need to know where, from where Jesus Christ has come. And with what authority He has done these things. And that's a word in our culture we don't like today. We don't like that word, authority. We don't like to have someone having authority over us. Because there's still a little bit of that rebellious spirit in us sometimes. But Jesus said we need to, be, we made him, we need to make him both Lord and Christ of our lives. That means we submit. And that means we humble ourselves. And that's something we're going to talk about next week when we get into John chapter 13. Because you remember how Mary humbled herself by anointing Jesus' feet with the oil and washing his feet with her hair. That is considered her glory. Hair, long hair with women was considered their glory. And then Jesus now in, in chapter 13 is going to wash his disciples' feet saying that a leader humbles himself and serves his people. He is not a dictator, but he is a servant. And with this leadership comes great responsibility and great sacrifice. So again, I titled this sermon, Look to the Father. Jesus looked to the Father. When the pressure of the cross was becoming so great, where could he go but to the Lord? He couldn't find the peace and solitude with his disciples. He had to go to the cross. So in conclusion, we also should look to the Father. When facing a crisis of whatever we have in our lives, look to the Father. Appeal to the Father. Sit at His feet. Give it all. We talk about casting our burdens. And that term, we kind of think of casting a rod. No, it's casting everything and giving it to the Father. And when you're scared and confused and don't know what to do, look to the Father. Look through Scripture and see evidence after evidence after evidence how God has sustained His people. Look at your own past, church, how God has sustained you and led you through trial after trial after trial. The evidence is there even in our own lives. And sometimes when we're hit with something so severe that our faith is rattled, look to the Father. I challenge us all, make the commitment today to put God first in your life, above everything else, no matter how important it is, no matter how much you love it, put God first. Sometimes that may mean we have to make some pretty hard choices. And when we put our commitment to make God first in our life, we must also listen.
to his commandments. We look at scripture, throughout scripture, how many commands he has given his church, he has given his followers, and put those commandments into practice. For well, let's always look to the Father. Whatever your need is this morning, and however way that we can help you, we ask that you come now as we stand.